Dementia is incurable and currently affects over 45 million people worldwide. However, this number is expected to rise to over 130 million people by 2050. Today we talk about the most common form of dementia, Alzheimer's. We will see what is happening inside the brains of people suffering from Alzheimer's and why there is currently no cure. My name is Kim Steinek and today we talk about one of the greatest challenges in biomedical history. Dementia is a general term for diseases which involve issues in regard to communication, language, perception, reasoning and the ability to focus. Statistics show that by the time we turn 80 years old, one third to one quarter of old people will show these symptoms. And in order to understand the symptoms, we first need to compare dementia with healthy aging. We say that in healthy aging, there is little loss in neurons, but changes in synaptic connections. This means that brain cells do not die in a large scale, but their connections change. However, in dementia there is also neuronal loss. And this loss might be caused by infections or toxins. However, in the majority of cases dementia is caused by structural changes in the brain. As already mentioned, Alzheimer's is the most common form of dementia and is caused by a progressive neurodegeneration. In the United States alone, over 400,000 people were diagnosed with Alzheimer's in 2000. Neurodegeneration means the brain cells progressively lose the function and the structure and this leads to death. If we take a look at the brain of someone who suffers from Alzheimer's and compare it to a healthy individual, then we see that a substantial loss of the brain volume occurred. Moreover, the ventricles are enlarged, the sulci are widened and the gurri are thinned. Frequently, the hippocampus is the first part of the brain which is affected. The hippocampus has different functions, one of which is the formation of new memories. Therefore, affected people often struggle to form new memories while being able to keep old memories for quite a long time. The amygdala, which has a crucial role in the control of emotions, is affected later on. Moreover, less neurotransmitters are produced, which results in affected people to communicate less and less with their surroundings. We can go on and talk further about the complexity of the disease. However, one is for sure. Alzheimer's is a progressive disease. This means that it gets worse over time and eventually leads to death. The first person to describe Alzheimer's was Alois Alzheimer. One of his major findings was the first description of the pathology of Alzheimer's at a cellular level. He saw the characteristic amyloid plaque and neurofibrillary tangles. Plaque comprises of several proteins, the major component being beta amyloid. Tangles, on the other hand, comprise the protein tau, which is in a hyperphosphorylated state. Alzheimer's can be sporadic or familial. We now know that the majority of cases is sporadic, which means there is no strong genetic link. And that means that Alzheimer's is not driven by single mutations most of the time. In about 1% of the cases, we can directly link Alzheimer's to a specific mutation. And here we most define mutations in APP, PS1 or PS2. PS1 and PS2 are proteins found in a membrane which cleave APP. And here comes the interesting part. If PS1, PS2 or APP do not function properly, APP is cleaved in such manner that the toxic form of amyloid beta is formed. As you might remember, amyloid beta is a major component of the plaque found in Alzheimer's. Okay, so why is amyloid beta toxic? We still do not know properly. And there are many reasons why it is difficult to answer this question. Firstly, extensive plaque is often found in healthy individuals which have not shown any signs of Alzheimer's. In these cases, plaque did not cause any symptoms. Secondly, early signs of this plaque can be found decades before the first symptoms occur. However, in regard to the second major aggregates, neurofibrillary tangles, we know a bit more. Tau normally stabilizes microtubules, which is very important for the transport of proteins along exomes. Since tau is a very important protein, its dysfunction is involved in a lot of diseases, which are called tau pathies. Tau pathies include Alzheimer's, but also specific types of Parkinson's and frontotemporal dementia. In the case of Alzheimer's, tau is hyperphosphorylated. This means that the protein is changed. These changes lead to less binding of tau to the microtubule, which then 
leads to destabilization, which of course cause a variety of issues in regard to the sorting of proteins. And of course, there are also a lot of questions remaining in how and why tau is hyperphosphorylated. There is, however, another aspect of Alzheimer's, which we have not discussed yet, the role of inflammation. You see, in healthy brains, we do not find most components of the immune system. Instead, we find microglia, a specialized cell type of the brain. Microglia basically take up material from the surrounding and digest it. A quite new theory suggests that microglia are involved in the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's. Due to very complex and again, not fully understand mechanisms, hyperphosphorylated tau and excessive amounts of amyloid beta are produced in neurons. The neurons try to get rid of these excessive amounts of proteins by budding them off. And now these small granules are released from the cells and microglia start to take them up. Then they get activated. The activation then induces inflammatory stress and leads to the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines. And this inflammatory state now leads to the degradation of synapses in the neurons and to the axons to become leaky. In very advanced stages, the cell dies and only plug and neurofibrillary tangles remain. Of course, there's still a lot to talk about Alzheimer's in order to grasp the concept. And then next week we'll see why there is currently no cure for Alzheimer's and why it is specifically hard to conduct research in this area. If you're interested in this or similar topics, let me know in the comment section. And don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell button to stay informed about the greatest discoveries in biomedical research. And with that, I'll see you.